God's church said. Amen. Amen. Let's dive in. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their net. And he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. So Jesus' ministry, as we've seen, began in the Sea of Galilee region, which is in the north of Israel. And it's actually, for us at least, kind of confusing, this text, because it says in verse 1 that Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. The lake of Gennesaret was actually a part of the Sea of Galilee. So this isn't a separate lake or a separate body of water. Rather, this is just one part of the Sea of Galilee, which we've been seeing through the Gospel of Luke. And the reason it's called this is because the Sea of Galilee was so big. It was some 13 miles long, 7 miles wide. And because of its size, um, different villages that were surrounding the Sea of Galilee, they would name that sea based upon their part of where they were living. So if you're in Tiberias, they called it the Lake of Tiberias. If you're in Gennesaret, they would call it the Lake of Gennesaret. Kind of like what we do here in North Carolina. You drive out to the coast, to Wilmington or whatever, and it's one big ocean, but there's also a series of bays and channels and inlets. You have Everett Bay and Waters Bay, same ocean, but you give it a different name depending on where you are. So that's what they did. When you read this, the Lake of Gennesaret, this is just one part of the larger Sea of Galilee. Now, we have a picture of the Lake of Gennesaret. And as you can see, this is a beautiful part of Galilee. Um, Surrounding the lake are rolling hills, uh, mountains. Um, The land around is, is fertile and rich. It's a great place for farming. And of course, the sea itself Um, is exceptional for fishing. The the water is sweet and crisp and clear. And and it's here at this spot, Luke 5, where, where Jesus is standing on the shore and he's beginning to teach the people. Um, our text tells us that at first he's standing there, and then the crowd begins to grow. More and more people begin to come. And as the crowd grows, Jesus, it says, gets into a boat, and he sets out a little bit from the shore, and there he begins to teach the people. Um, Jesus essentially is using the technology of the day. Um, as you know, if you're on a boat, you need to be careful what you say, because your words will travel far over water. And Jesus, as this crowd is growing, he wants a better way to reach these people. And so by standing here in this boat, teaching the people, they all would have been able to hear him. Now check this out. It says that he's teaching them, but Luke actually doesn't really give us details as to what it was that he was saying. Uh, We'll see later on In the Gospel of Luke, there's a ton of red letters, uh, lots of stories, uh, lots of teachings that Jesus gives that Luke records for us, and we'll get to those in about 13, 14 years or so. Um, But here, we don't know what it was. There are, however, some clues. Um, If you look back with me in chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. So whatever it is that Jesus is teaching at the Sea of Gennesaret, we know that foundational and fundamental to his message, core to what Jesus is talking about, is this message of the kingdom of God. Now I want to pause there for a second. What was Jesus talking about when he talked about the kingdom of God? I think it's essential for us to wrap our minds around this understanding because over and over again throughout the Gospel of Luke, we see Jesus talking about, preaching about, teaching about the kingdom. Forty different times in Luke, the kingdom is mentioned. So what did he mean by that? Well, what did the first century Jews mean when they talked about the kingdom? They actually had a a fairly specific definition of what they thought the kingdom was like. If you ask the average Galilean at that time, hey, what's the kingdom of God? He or she would have said, well, it's something to do with 
God overthrowing the tyranny of the Romans, right? Rome ruled the world at that time. They oppressed the Jewish people. The Jewish people hated the Romans. And so they were longing for the day when Rome would be vanquished and when God would restore Israel to its place of prominence in the world. So for them, the phrase kingdom of God, it was a, it was a political term primarily, but Jesus, he had a far more nuanced, expansive, multi-dimensional view of what the kingdom was about. It wasn't about conquering Rome through military power. It was the conquest of the human heart through the power of the gospel. So we need to understand that when Jesus is talking about this, he's not talking about political things primarily, nor is he just talking about heaven, as many people seem to, or at least for years, I thought every time Jesus talked about the kingdom, it was just another euphemism or synonym for heaven. No, there's something more that's going on here. So how do we define that? Well, one scholar put it this way. He said, the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. Essentially, the idea is this. If you have a king, then you have a kingdom, right? So the kingdom is the place where the king exercises his authority. Um, I think the best definition is Jesus. He taught us to pray in Luke 11. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, that's huge. Jesus here is associating his kingdom with his will. So wherever the will of the king is being accomplished, there we can say that the kingdom of God is present. Now this has all kinds of implications, right, for our life. If you're pursuing God, seeking God, following God, which most of you are, right, God's kingdom is at work in your life. If you're salt and light in your place of employment and you're sharing the gospel and you're inviting people to come to Christ, we can say God's kingdom is at work in your place of employment. If as a married couple or in your singleness, you're pursuing hard after Jesus, he is your goal, he is your love, then God's kingdom is present in your singleness or in your marriage. So God's kingdom then is the space where God's will is being accomplished. It's the rule of God. It's the healing, life-giving presence of God all over the world. It's where his shalom is overcoming sin and brokenness and injustice. Now, this is a fascinating thing to me. When, when you talk about the kingdom and when you look at Jesus' definition of kingdom, he, he referred to it um, in, in two different ways. Um, in one sense, Jesus would use language describing the presentness of the kingdom. He would say things like the kingdom of God is with you, it's among you, it's within you, it's here and now. But then there are other places where Jesus would talk about the kingdom that is yet to come. Now, Bible scholars refer to this, they have a fancy, fancy term, they call it inaugurated eschatology. Um, which I guess is just a fancy way of justifying thousands of dollars of seminary education or something. It's very, very simple what it means, very biblical. It just means the kingdom of God is both now, but it is also yet to come. Now, this, this is really huge. I think a lot of Christians get confused with this point. It's here and now. It's at work. It's breaking into the present moment through Christ, through the Spirit, through the church, but it is also yet to come. We cannot say that the kingdom of God is here in its fullest sense, right? I know there are some with an eschatology that would say this is the kingdom, to which I often say, well, really, <laughs> right? You look at the world and there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of brokenness, right? It's not fully here yet, but we also have this understanding that God is up to something in the world. This morning, um, got up and uh, went out for a run with my dog. And uh, it was beautiful. I don't know how many of you saw the sun sunrise this morning, but absolutely gorgeous. And I started the run and it was dark. And then halfway in, all of a sudden, uh, these colors begin to paint the sky and then the birds start to sing and rabbits start running across our trail. My dog's like, you know, dragging me all over. But there's something that happens. It's still technically dark, 
but, but there is this sense that something is breaking in on the horizon, right? The kingdom of God is something like that, where we look at this world and we say, man, things aren't as they ought to be. There's still tons of darkness, right? There's wars and injustice and rigged elections in the Ukraine and disease and cancer and heartache and heartbreak. There's all kinds of things that we look at and say, wow, this world isn't right. But then on the other hand, we see signs of life. We see that God is at work through church plants and through changed lives and reconciliation and healed marriages and people coming to know Jesus. Um, When I was in England, I had a chance a couple days ago um, to go go for a run with this guy named Nikolai. Um, I taught at this church and when I was done, he and I started talking and he's I asked him, hey, is there any good places to run around here? He said, I'll take you, I'll take you. And so late that night, it's like 10 o'clock at night, we, we go for this run, and I'm expecting it to be, you know, maybe two or three miles or something because it was so late. I didn't know that he signed me up for a half marathon. We ran for a mile or an hour and a half. It was crazy. Um, but it was awesome, too, because as we're running, Nikolai, kind of in his broken English, he's from Romania, um, he begins to tell me his story. And, in, and truly, it was one of the most heartbreaking stories I've ever heard. Um, he grew up in orphanages. His, his mom was homeless, um, had all kinds of mental issues. She died when he was very, very young. Um, he never met his dad, has no idea who his father was. Uh, he was bounced around 11 different orphanages where he was traumatized and abused and exposed to so much stuff. And as he's growing up in this context, um, he's just telling me like what it was doing to his heart and how he became just broken and and then became very angry. Um, Even at the age of nine, he started getting into drugs and alcohol and even crime. Um, He told me a story of how he stole something from a store at age nine. The guy runs after him, he gets hit by a car, it blinded him in one of his eyes, to this day he's blind there. Um, and, And it just was all falling apart. When he was in his early 20s, someone told him about this job opportunity at a church in York, England, Calvary Chapel. And, and he's just thinking, hey, this would be a good chance to you know, make some money. And so he said, yes, he moved there, had no idea that Jesus was about to get a hold of his life. And he hears the gospel for the first time. He gets saved. The church brings him under their wing. They begin to mentor him and disciple him. He's been there for four years now. And as we're running, he said, Dominic, he said, I have a lot of, of pain, a lot of pain in my life. But he said, I thank God for Jesus. <laughs> and I thank God for what he's done and the power of the gospel because he is changing me day after day after day. What is that? And that's the presence and the power of the gospel. It's God's kingdom breaking into the heartache of this man's life. And brothers and sisters, that's what we get to be a part of as the church. We are called to go out and be God's fingerprints and hands and feet in culture, in society, in our city, sharing the good news, bringing others to Christ, and allowing God's kingdom to be visibly present through our life. So whatever it is that Jesus is talking about here, maybe he's using parables, maybe he's taking them through the word and talking about the kingdom that way, we know that he's highly highlighting God's redemptive plan for the world, and he has their attention, right? They're standing on tiptoes. They're listening in on what he has to say. The crowd is growing as they are hungry to hear the word of God. Now, check this out. As the story continues, verse 5 or verse 4, it says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, (laughs) this is a very, very interesting story. Um, Here we're introduced to Simon, um, also known as Peter. Simon uh, literally means shifting sand, or or we could say um, unstable, uh, unfaithful, all over the map. Peter, does anyone know what Peter means? Yeah, rock. Interesting. So 
So Simon Peter, or Simon means unstable, shifting sand, right? Peter is rock. Now, here's the intriguing thing, and here's why I point this out. Before this story, he's called Simon. After this story, he's called Peter. And in the story, and this story alone, he's called Simon Peter. In fact, if you look in verse 8, that's what he's referred to as. So before, shifting sand. After, rocky, right? Right in the middle, Simon Peter. What's going on here? Luke here is letting us know that something is about to happen in this story that would permanently and and irrevocably revolutionize his life. There is some kind of identity transformation that is about to unfold. Um, It says here that his trade was a fisherman. Um, As we've talked about in the weeks before, fishing was a thriving industry around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Josephus, who was a first century historian, he said that there were 330 fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. There's 16 different ports. It was a stable in the ancient Mediterranean. And so Peter is part of a thriving industry, this high intensity job. But on this particular day, things aren't going that well. In fact, we read in our text, Jesus says to him, hey, go out into the deep. And Peter says, verse 5, I've been fishing all night, and I haven't caught anything. Um, Some scholars say that this is actually the first miracle of the Gospel of Luke, because you have a fisherman telling the truth, right? (laughs) Usually it's like, hey, I've caught this this big, right? No, it's this big. But here he's actually a broken, hurting man. He says, I've been out all night, And I haven't caught anything. It's not going that well. And Jesus says to him, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Could you imagine what Peter is thinking at this point? Um, Here's a guy who, for all intents and purposes for Peter, is a stranger. He'd never met Jesus before, doesn't know much about this Jesus. Peter's a fisherman. He lived and dreamed and breathed and ate fish. That was his life, right? He knew the trade inside and out. And here comes this guy that he had never met before who's a carpenter by trade, who from Peter's perspective doesn't know a thing about fishing, and he comes up to him and gives him advice on how to do his job. Now, this can be a very annoying thing, right? Have you ever had someone do that to you, tell you how to do your business? Um, a couple months ago, I had this whole issue with, with this tooth that turned into a root canal, then an abscess. It was, it was horrible. And um, I was doing some research, like we often do now when you're sick, doing some Google stuff. I thought I had it all figured out. I thought I knew exactly what was going on. And so I go and I see the dentist. He walks in, super nice guy. And he's like, hey, uh, how's it going? What, what's the problem? And I said, well, here, here's the deal. And I just go, I'm using all this fancy te- dentist jargon. I'm like, oh, it's this, this, and this, and you need to do this, this, and this. And he just kind of looks at me, and his face was classic. He, he just kind of nods and listens politely, and he's like, that's nice. And then he just kind of walked over in the corner, grabbed some paper. He's like, well, actually, this is what's going on. And I wasn't even close. I wasn't even the same ballpark of the actual deal. I'm like, no, I'm telling the tooth. And... Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, jet lag. Um, But it's not fun, right? If someone's telling you to do your job, if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Here's here's Peter. He's a fisherman. He knows this. And Jesus comes up to him and says, hey, I've got some advice for you. I think you should go a little deeper. Throw out your nets there and see what happens. Now, Peter had no practical reason to obey Jesus here. None at all, right? Right? He's tired, he'd been fishing all night, he knew the lake inside and out, and yet he obeyed. He said, because you say so, I've got the underlined in my Bible, because you say so, I will let down the nets for a catch. The only reason that Peter obeyed Jesus was because Jesus told him to. What was it about this carpenter from Nazareth? But maybe it was the joy 
that he had, the sparkle in his eye. Maybe it was just the, the power of his teaching. Maybe there's just this sense of the kingdom of God that was with him. Maybe it's just the way that he looked at Peter and his eyes are digging into Peter's heart. There was something about this Jesus that when Jesus told him to go, he was willing to go. That, brothers and sisters, is the essence. It is the heart of what it means to be a disciple. Being a follower of Jesus means going when he tells you to go. It means launching out into the deep, even though it makes absolutely no sense to you or to anyone else around you. Why on earth would you do that? Why would you go there? Why would you take that step? Why would you say yes to that situation? And the only reason you do it is because he said so. And for so many of you, that is your story, right? Your life is a story of, well, there were times God led me, he opened doors for me, I know other people didn't understand, it didn't add up financially, practically, relationally, whatever, but you obeyed. I, I think of those of you who helped start the church in moving here from different states, that's your story, right? You hear about this church plant six months ago, and God just begins to stir your heart and say, you know what, you need to be a part of this. And there are lots of other people perhaps in your life that's like, you're crazy. Why would you do that? Why would you go there? That makes no sense at all. And yet something was happening in your soul. God was speaking to you. I think of Anthony and uh, Melissa sitting in the back there. Um, if you guys haven't met Anthony and Melissa, you need to. They're some of the most amazing godly people I know. And uh, Anthony was up here playing bass, incredible musician as well. But <laughs> their story is just amazing. Um, they lived in Sacramento and uh, they, they were blessed. I mean, they both had amazing jobs, amazing network of friends and family and church. And then God just began to speak in some interesting ways and he began to stir their hearts. They were visiting Portland. They hear about this church plant, Emmaus, and it just something began to happen in their heart, and they started to pray about it. And then on Twitter, of all places, um, they hear, hey, there's this guy named Dominic, and he's going to be speaking at a church in Sacramento this week, and um, maybe, you know, maybe go check it out or something. And they, they see that, think, hey, why not? We live here. Let's go, let's go see him. And so they show up at this church where I was speaking, and when I was done, they come up to me, hey, Anthony, I'm Melissa, Melissa, good to meet you and all that, and they say, hey, could we, could we take you out to In-N-Out Burger uh, for lunch? And I'm like, when you pray about that, yes, right? God's kingdom is there in the double-double, right? It's evidence of God's work in this world. And so we sit down, and we have a great meal together, and, and they just begin to share with me um, how God was completely wrecking their life through this church plant thing. And they're like, we can't shake it. We don't know why. It makes no sense at all. And the more you hear their story, you're like, why would you leave all that, right? And yet they knew it was of the Lord. And, and so they moved here. They took the step of faith. They launched out into the deep. And we could go on and on and on for that is, for so many of you, that's your story too. Over and over again, at different points in your life, God has spoken to you. He's given you instruction. He's opened some kind of door and it made no sense. But you did it anyway. And here's the beautiful thing about obeying the Lord is that when we take that step of faith, it's only after that that we can look back and begin to understand what God was up to all along. Here's a great quote by a guy named Augustine. Um, he said this, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. That's so huge, right? I so often get it backwards. I, I wanna understand first. <laughs> Okay, show me how this is gonna work financially. Show me how these pieces are gonna come together. Show me, God, how on earth I'm gonna take care of this issue if I say goodbye to it. And once all those pieces are in a row, I say, okay, let's go. Now, is that faith? No, that's just, do the pros outweigh the cons? Does this add up? Does this make sense? And, and for so many, that's how we live our life. We just do things that seem to make sense in the moment. But faith isn't like that. 
Faith is saying, go into the deep, but you've been out all night fishing and you've caught nothing. (laughs) Faith is saying, I will trust you and take this step first. And once you take that step, then you look back and the understanding comes. Now, here's the deal with this quote by Augustine. The understanding part may happen immediately. That's what takes place in this story. Or it may take place in a year or two later, or it may not happen till heaven, right? So often we want to know why on earth, God, did you lead me? You've taken the step of faith. You've done what God told you to do. You've walked through the open door and then you get there and you're like, okay, (laughs) what's next? You know what I'm talking about? Those times in life where you think God's leading you and guiding you and you're not yet seeing the fruit. You're not yet seeing pieces come together. Listen, the understanding can take potentially years to develop and evolve. And this is where patience comes in. This is where faithfulness comes in because as we're faithful, it's then that the fruitfulness begins to come. Remember what Jesus said when he washed his disciples' feet? He said, what you're doing now, you don't understand. (laughs) This makes no sense to you. But then he said what? You will understand hereafter. In other words, a day is coming when this will make sense. Maybe for some of you, that's a word right now. You're in that stage and you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand what God's up to. Lord, why are you allowing this? And the Lord could be saying to some, you will understand hereafter. The understanding is the reward of faith. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Verse six, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. So check this out. Peter obeys. He launches into the deep and he finds the thing that he had been searching for all night long. Listen, Jesus has what you're searching for. You obey him, you follow him, you give your life to him, you will find that satisfaction. You will find the longing, the yearning of your soul. He goes out there, and it's not just one or two fish, it's dozens and dozens of fish. It's more fish than he had ever seen in his life. There's so many, the nets begin to break. He calls out for help. Hey, James and John, I need you, get over here now. They come over, they start to fill their boats with fish, and the boats begin to sink. I mean, this is crazy. It's so dramatic. It's so over the top. And have you ever wondered when you read this story, why did Jesus do it this way? Like he he could have just said, okay, go into the deep, let out your nets, and, and there's three or four fish that jump in, right? And they come back, okay, well done. You listen to me. There's your reward, a few fish. Why did he do it this way, in such a dramatic, over-the-top way? A couple thoughts. I think number one, because Jesus is generous, right? We serve a God who does abundantly, exceedingly more than we ask, think, or imagine. We serve the kind of God, the Bible says, that where sin abounds, God's grace abounds yet more. We serve a God who will break the nets with the abundance of fish. So this is just a picture of God's lavish grace that is being poured out on Peter's life. But but secondly, um, I, I think what's going on here is this is a sign of things to come. All of these fish was Jesus' way of telling Peter, Peter, I am about to do something that is far, far bigger than you. I'm going to use you, Peter, to bring thousands into the kingdom. Peter, you are about to embark on a journey that will turn the world upside down. Notice that he says, go into the deep. Jesus could have said, just go and throw out your nets on the shore, right? A few feet out. Now he says, go deeper. If we want to see what God is up to, If we want to step into the fullness of his purpose and plan, we need to let go of the shore. We need to go into the deep. We need to go beyond the comfort zone. 
What I so often do is I want to have one hand or one toe on the shore, right? Okay, I, I have my escape hatch. I have my plan B. If things don't work out, I'm heading back to land, right? But what Jesus calls us to is to let go of the shore, to move out beyond where it's comfortable and safe, to go into the deep waters. What deep waters is he calling you to today? What shore is he calling you to let go of? Peter obeys, he goes out, and look at his response, verse eight. It says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and followed him. This is really interesting. Jesus blesses Peter with far more fish than he had ever seen. He hooks him up, which is a horrible fish pun. Um, and what's Peter's response to this? I would think that Peter would fall on his face and start to worship, start to praise. Okay, Jesus, I wanna be with you. I love you, this is amazing. You're amazing, right? You would think that would be the natural response. But actually, his response was just the opposite. It says, go away from me, Lord for I'm a sinful man. And in the Greek language, it's very, very dogmatic. Jesus, I don't want to be with you. I don't want to see you. This is too much for me right now. What's going on here? Why would Peter say this? Here's why. At this moment, Peter has this deep, visceral sense of his own unworthiness. After seeing the way in which Jesus blessed him, Peter is fully aware, painfully conscious of all of his inadequacies. He knew that he wasn't worthy of such blessing. He knew the ways that he had fallen short, the sins that he had committed. And he was also aware in that moment of the beauty and the gravity and the power of this Jesus. He was aware that he was in the presence of someone that he had never experienced before. And so he blurts out, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Now track with me here. This this to me is absolutely mind-blowing. And I wanna close with this. If you compare this story of Luke 5 with the story in John 21, we find a very, very different response that Peter had. Um, it's, it's almost the identical story, actually. Um, Luke 5, out fishing all night, catches nothing, going to the deep, he catches a ton of fish. John 21, almost identical. It's three years later, it's after the resurrection. Peter is discouraged. He goes out on the Sea of Galilee. He fishes all night. He catches nothing. Jesus shows up and says, hey, let out your nets on the other side. Peter obeys. He catches tons of fish. It's almost the identical story. But there's one key difference. What's the difference? The way that Peter responded. In Luke chapter five, he says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He felt unworthy, inadequate. I'm not good enough to follow you. I'm not good enough to obey you. In John 21, his response is what? It's the Lord. And he jumps into the sea and he swims everything he's worth to get to the shore and to be right by Jesus' side. So in one story, he's pushing Jesus away. In the other story, he's bringing Jesus close. In one story, depart from me, God, I'm not worthy. In the other story, Jesus, I want to be where you are. What happened? What happened from Luke 5 to John 21? Something transformed in his soul. Something happened to his perspective, and this is it. It's a single word, grace. 
after three years of following Jesus, being with Jesus, watching Jesus, observing Jesus, Jesus dying for him on the cross, Jesus washing his feet, after learning and serving and being with Jesus, Peter understood it's not about my worthiness. It's not about my holiness. It's not about how good I am. It's not about how strong I am. It's 110% about his worthiness, his goodness, his beauty, and his love. Peter grew in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that grace enabled Peter to launch into the deep, to face his insecurities, to go wherever the Lord called him to go because he understood it's not about me. My life is not my own and I will serve him and follow him and be with him wherever and whenever he tells me to follow. And this brings me to our question today. Where are you living? What is your story right now? Are you the Peter of Luke chapter five? Or are you the Peter of John 21? When Jesus says, launch into the deep, let go of the shore, follow me, be my disciple, what is your response? Do you say, depart from me, Lord? <laughs> and you have a ton of reasons why you can't follow. I'm not good enough, worthy enough. I don't have enough time, energy, focus, money, whatever the case may be. And we have our excuses and we push Jesus away. We would rather keep Jesus in a box on Sunday morning. That's good enough for us, right? I'll go to church, do my thing. There is no reason at all for Jesus to intersect with my daily life. Or are you the Peter of John 21 when he bids you to come, you jump in the water. You launch into the deep. You're willing to go. You're willing to follow. You're willing to serve. Where are you at? And if, if you're not at that point of radically following Jesus, what on earth is keeping you back from it? What's keeping you from it? In our story, it says that they left behind their nets and they followed him. And it's not just nets, we're talking thousands of fish. Peter potentially had enough money to live off of for quite some time. But he left all of that to serve him, to follow him. What, what nets in your life right now are keeping you from serving Jesus with radical abandon? Maybe for some, it's an unhealthy relationship. And you know that if you're honest with God, that that isn't of the Lord. And he's been stirring your heart. You don't have peace. And, and what would it look like for you to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm giving that to you. I'm gonna serve you and follow you with all my heart. Maybe for others, it has to do with just bitterness or unforgiveness. Someone who hurt you and wronged you and wounded you and it's festering and stirring in your heart and you can't seem to let it go. Maybe for others, it's another kind of net. Maybe it's the internet, right? There's a reason they call it the World Wide Web. And so many people are just caught up in that, whether it's just an excessive amount of time and over-dependence on it, or maybe it has to do with pornography and those kinds of issues. And you know that in your heart right now, the Lord is saying, let that net go. Serve me, follow me. Maybe for others, it's just fear, fear of the unknown. What if I let go of the shore? What will he say? What will happen to my job? What will happen with my friends? Maybe it's a lack of trust. Maybe it's disappointment disillusionment, maybe it's cynicism towards God or towards the church. Listen, whatever it is that may be keeping us back from serving Jesus this way, I promise you, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I mean, what if Peter had said, you know, thanks so much for the invitation, Lord, and thanks for all the fish, that's great, but I kind of like it here, right? This is my home. This is where I live. This is my family. I've got this set up here. You know what? I'm just going to hang out here for a while. No need to serve and follow. Can you imagine all the things that Peter would have missed out on? Thousands of people being brought into the kingdom 
I will make you a fisher of men. He would have missed out on Pentecost preaching the gospel and 3,000 are saved and days later, thousands of others, he would have missed seeing the world turned upside down for just a bunch of fish. Whatever it is that is keeping you from launching into the deep, I promise you it is not worth it. I believe that today the Lord is calling us as a church and he's calling you individually and as families and marriages and singleness, he is calling us to deeper waters. Paul talked about that. He said, I'm running the race. I'm pressing forward. He had this advanced mentality. He, he wasn't just gonna stick around where it was comfortable and safe and secure. And if I could just say this as a church, we're six months in and praise God for what he's done. That's awesome. But you know what? We, we were just getting started. I never ever want to be a church where we say, okay, great, we've got a little gathering thing going on and we have our little home groups and cool, we'll just, we're content with this. Now, I want to be a community of people where we are pressing forward, where we're going to deeper waters because brothers and sisters, there is a ton of work to do. There are lives who need to be saved. There are people who near, need to hear the gospel. There's missionaries, I believe, in this church who need to be sent out into this area and into the world to preach the gospel. There's churches that need to be planted. I just got a call a week and a half ago, right before I left for England, a guy who lives a couple hours away. He says, there's a group of people here and we heard about what God's doing at Emmaus. Would you pray about sending someone to start a church here? Man, there is work for us to do. I don't wanna be a part of a church where we just say, you know what, let's be safe and comfortable and secure. We've got our little worship thing going on. No. And if we can be a church, though, that we are following Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, where we're letting go of things that bring us comfort and security to launch out into deeper waters, sign me up for that. That's what I want this community to be about. More importantly, that's what God wants us to be about. That's why he planted this church to begin with. There is so much more that he has for us. And listen, there is so much more that he has for you today. Every single one of us. He is giving you, he's giving me the invite, launch into the deep. How will we respond? Depart from me, it's too uncomfortable, or Lord, I'm diving in, I'm pursuing you, I'm not holding anything back. Let's pray.